Uh, welcome everyone. And this is uh, Desi Vijay. I'm a North South National Team member and a coordinator for webinars. Glad to see you all today. As all you know, um, our registrations for this year's in-person regional contacts are all open. Uh, this year it's going to be in-person instead of online as we had for the past few years. <clears throat> and also just like previous years, we are bringing in a few of our past winners of various subject matters to talk to you, the younger peers about their experience, provide some tips and answer their questions. We call this Meet the Pro type webinar session. Today we will talk about science. We have four very enthusiastic youngsters with me ready to talk to you. Um, they will also make a brief presentation on, on other subjects. Uh, thank you for attending and thank you for all your support. Uh, without uh, further ado, let's go to the show. Uh, but before we proceed further, let me get the usual ground uh, housekeeping rules or comments out of the way. Uh, we are recording the webinar as we speak right now, and then we will send you a link to all of you by tomorrow. Um, if you want to listen to any of the previous webinars, now we have an option to turn uh, view them in the YouTube um, North South channel. Please subscribe to our channel and then watch and enjoy the past webinars. If you still have any specific webinar you wanted to watch, see, then you let us know at the webinars at northsouth.org and I'll send you the link. The regional campus registrations have started and we'll be sharing some high level uh, contest information here, but please visit North South website for more information and then register for the contest. Thank you for listening and uh, let's move on. Four outstanding bride youngsters here to talk to you and also uh, make a small presentations and just to keep interest in the subject. Uh, I will introduce them one by one and I request them to make their presentation as it. And after that, we will go to Q&A after all the presentations are done. And uh, But however, you can start uh, posting your questions right away. Uh, we will start with uh, Maya, Maya Sriram. Uh, she is no stranger to us and has taken part in all of our previous webinars, uh, MTB webinars in science for the past few years and also presented the webinar. She's a 16 year old science enthusiast studying in basic independent Silicon Valley. Uh, Maya has been uh, competing in North South Foundation contest since she was a second grade and has won numerous awards in both science and brain bee. Last summer, she participated in prestigious Cosmos High School summer camp in nanochemistry and nanotechnology cluster. She has participated in Neuroscience Club, Science Bowl, Science Olympiad, and Biology Olympiad at her school. Her Science Olympiad team made it to the state level and she qualified for the second round of USA Bevo testing. She has also co-founded a non-profit neuroscience art auction, selling art to raise money for the neuroscience organizations. As of now, she has successfully raised over $3,500. And uh, uh, we really want, uh, like to have uh, welcome uh, Maya here. And then she'll be talking a little bit of, about chemistry topics. And before that, she will also give us the uh, general rules of the uh, contest overall, so contest information. So Maya, take it away. Yeah, sure, I'll take it away, thank you. Okay, first I wanted to talk a little bit about contest information so that all of you know a little bit about what the Science Bee is and what you're gonna be doing with it. So first of all, there, for if you're completely new here, there are three levels of competition in Science B. Junior Science B is grades one, two, and three, and that's a very fundamental surface level understanding of science. Then intermediate science B goes a little bit more into it. You need to know a few details, a few properties, but more, more than that. Then senior science B grade six, seven, and eight is the middle school science. It goes the most deep. It's where the sciences really start splitting into biology, chemistry, and physics more than they had before. So that's something to remember and make sure you study, you know, to the level that you are in, because junior science is naturally going to be much easier than senior. 
Okay, so science B contests are only written examinations. There's no oral portion and each contestant is given a set of 30 questions to answer, right? The maximum time is 30 minutes, so that's about a minute per question. No calculator and there's no partial credit for steps. There's no negative points for incorrect answer. So I guess guess on anything that you think you might not know and make sure that your answer is correct. That all, that's all that really matters here. It doesn't really matter how you got to that answer. And then there's another level of competition beyond the regional round, which is around in your city or near you. It's called national finals, and it occurs about once every year, held at a state somewhere across the United States. And invitation to the national finals is based on the scores of all the contestants nationally. And it doesn't matter what rank you got, because, for example, you could have gotten 25 out of 30 questions correct and gotten second place, maybe. But in another region that's a lot more competitive, someone might have gotten 29 and the top three might have all gotten 30 out of 30. So it doesn't really matter what ranks you got in your local competition. The main thing that matters is NSF is going to look at all the grades and set like a standard. For example, someone, everyone who got over a score of 27 will get to go to the national finals. And then if you got that score, you'll get the invite. And then here on the screen is a helpful website for preparation. I know you guys can not click on it, so maybe uh, we can put it in the chat later on. But there's a lot of good, you know, books and websites. Like I know there's a bunch of McGraw Hill textbooks that are good. You could use science full practice questions if you're in higher grades. Just go to the NSF website and the Science B tab and click on the link that says resources on the top. And that'll give you a whole list of textbooks and websites and all of those that you can use to prepare. There's something to keep in mind. You can switch. Yeah, um, some information about the about the online competitions. I don't think our audience can click on this link. So will this slide be shared with them later on? Yes. Yeah, we'll send them tomorrow. The slide. OK, so this slide will be sent to you tomorrow. Just know that there's some information about our science competitions, regional contests, and then you can look at the calendar, choose the time that best works for you, the regional contest calendar, online registration, new parents, a little bit of information for you, and then the info sessions from 2021. We did something very similar last year, and then a link for coaching where you can learn about science and math and all of those. All right, now I'll launch into my presentation, I guess. I wanted to talk about a few basic chemistry topics. Now, just keep in mind that most of what I'm going to say right now is attuned to sixth to eighth graders, so it's slightly more advanced than anything um, junior, or even intermediate kids will need to know. So make sure you study based on that fact, and you don't need to start know this much if you're still in elementary school. All right, so there's four main subtopics that I saw within basic chemistry on the NSF exam, right? States and transitions, reactions, periodic table, and atoms. Within states and transitions, that's things like, you know, you have got to consider the properties of matter, you know, has, has mass, it takes up space, that kind of thing. You also need to know about temperature and pressure and what effect it may have right, on matter. And then you also need to know about elements, compounds and mixtures. What's the difference? Why would something be designated as an element versus a mixture? I actually have a practice question about that. We'll talk a little bit more about it. And then you also need to know about reactions, right? physical and chemical changes. I'm sure you all have learned about this in school. There's a bunch of different ways to describe them, actually. So it's important that you know how to figure out if something is a physical change or a chemical change. You also need to know this is just for seniors, and I think maybe a little bit for intermediates, but it's primarily for seniors. A little bit about chemical equations, you know, like if you add one reactant or one compound to another, what kind of products will it form? in what ratio, so like how much of one product do you need to form another product, that kind of thing. And you also need to know a little bit about acids and bases. Now, acids are just um, substances that have a lot of H plus ions and bases have a bunch of OH minus ions, and you need to know what that means for them, how they interact, that kind of thing. Again, mostly a senior based concept. Now, what about the periodic table? I mean, I put a picture of the periodic table in the slide so I could talk about it a little bit more. We got to know what it can show us about an atom. Like, for example, if you look at carbon, right? Carbon has a six on it, and you need to know that is carbon's atomic number, and that tells us the number of protons in carbon. And you also need to know maybe on a more advanced periodic table, you'd be able to see its mass. You need to know that that is 12 and what that really tells you about the atom. You need to know what 12 minus 6 means in the context of carbon, that kind of thing. You also need to know about chemical, I mean, 
sorry, electron configurations, which are, that's again, more of a senior topic. You can take an atom and you need to know how to figure out the electron configuration of it. It's a entire entirely new topic in middle school actually that you need to learn. So I won't go too much into it right now, but it's something that you need to learn completely and figure out. And then you also need to learn about bond formation, right? Ionic bonds, covalent bonds, metallic bonds. What kind of bonds, if you take two atoms on this periodic table, what kind of bonds will they form with each other? What properties will that bond have? Will that bond actually form? That kind of thing. Now, what about atoms, our last topic? Within atoms, you need to know a little bit about the scientists. There's a bunch of scientists who contributed to figuring out the structure and nature of an atom, like Dalton, Rutherford, Bohr, etc. And you need to remember who they are and what they did or what they contributed. You also need to know a little bit about the atom models, right? What an atom looks like, the models that most of the scientists can already contributed, like what an atom looks like, where its nucleus is, where its electrons are, what that means for the nature of an atom, that kind of thing. There's also a few modern topics within atoms, again, mostly a senior thing. This is things like, you know, energy levels and releasing electrons if pelted with enough energy, alpha and beta um, configurations, that kind of thing. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. Okay, I wanted to show you guys a couple of types of questions that you may happen to see on the exam. These I mostly got from online because I don't, I didn't want to show you like direct questions from NSF. So I just showed you some questions based on the topics that I had told you about in the past slide. So first of all, for the first topic, I had this question that is talking about elements, mixtures, and compounds, right? Pure substances are further divided into elements and compounds, right? And which one best describes the dust found on a vehicle over time? Just for a little bit of a quick overview, if you don't know what elements and compounds are, elements are a substance that's in its pure nature, as in it cannot be broken down further by normal, typical processes. For example, just plain oxygen or something of that sort. It cannot be broken down. But if you do have a compound, like for example, table salt is sodium chloride, you can break that down still into sodium and chlorine. So that would be classified as a compound because it's two elements that are bonded together I suppose you could say two elements that are bonded together by a chemical change. That's another way of thinking about it. Anyway, rust is actually defined as iron oxide. That's how it works. The iron in a substance bonds with the oxygen in the atmosphere, and that produces iron oxide, which is rust, and which is what you don't want because it makes your appliances weaker. So we know that we know the difference between an element and a compound. The element is in its base form. A compound is multiple elements bonded together and it can be broken down. And we'd be able to tell you that, you know, iron oxide is a compound. All right. So looking at the next question, which of the following cor correctly identifies the reaction reactants for the reaction given below? CH4 plus CL2 with UV light make become CH3Cl plus HCl. For this, you basically need to understand a chemical equation. And if you did understand a chemical equation, you'd know that the reactants are often what's on the left side of the equation and the products are what's created when the reactants interact and form what's on the right side of the equation. So in this case, the reactants for the reaction given below would be CH4 plus CO2. I think we can go on to the next slide. All right, another question that I had for the third topic is, it's about the periodic table. So why is cobalt placed before nickel on the periodic table of the elements, even though it has a higher average atomic mass than nickel? Well, you know, if you knew about the periodic table, you know that the order of the elements on the periodic table depends on how many protons they have. So it counts the atomic number of each uh, element on the periodic table actually correlates directly to the number of protons that they happen to have. So if cobalt is placed before nickel on the periodic table, in other words, has a smaller atomic number, that means it has to have less protons. You could probably go with A safely, nickel has one more proton. All right, and then let's look at the last question. Which of the following describes what happens as a chlorophyll pigment absorbs energy from sunlight, right? Let me just read out the answers to an electron moves to a higher electron shell and the electron's potential energy increases. An electron moves to a higher electron shell and its potential energy decreases. An electron drops to a lower electron shell and releases its energy as heat. An electron drops to a lower electron shell and its potential energy increases. An electron of sunlight is transferred to chlorophyll, producing a chlorophyll ion with higher potential energy. 
This is actually a fairly high level question, and I'm not entirely sure if this kind of thing would be on the senior exams at all, but it's still important to know since it was one of the topics we talked about, you know, modern topics in chemistry. Essentially what happens when a chlorophyll pigment is going to absorb energy from sunlight is that that energy is going to get injected into an electron, which is going to make it vibrate more rapidly. And if you know about atoms, if you know about how electrons are in atoms, you know that with um, outside a nucleus, which is positively charged, electrons are kind of in shells. What happens when an electron is injected with energy and made to vibrate very rapidly is it kind of moves up one of those energy levels, which is not where it's supposed to be. So suddenly it has a lot of potential energy and kind of wants to get back to where it was supposed to be or in the energy level that it was supposed to be despite all this excess energy. So the correct answer here is an electron moves to a higher electron shell and the electron's potential energy increases. But I mean, again, I don't know that this is something that is that you'd necessarily all need to know for the competition. All right, um, I think you can move on to the next slide. All right, I want to talk a little bit about NSF itself and why I did these competitions, what benefits I got from them. First of all, if you're wondering about whether to choose NSF or not, I think I'd say definitely go for it because I really enjoyed what I've done here. And it's also been really useful for me as a person developing with math, science, all of that. First of all, it really aids a foundation in basic subjects, right? When I was in elementary school, I did one science class at school occasionally, and that was it. So it encouraged me to study math and science a lot more because I would look at the syllabus and I would kind of review the topics on my own. I did coaching a couple of years, so it was very helpful in creating that foundation for me to really excel at science when I got to middle school and it got split up into biology, chemistry, and physics. You can also form a community with other students and parents. I know my, my parents personally have something like 20 friends they found just through NSF, you know, just talking to people at NSF through my sister and I making friends with, you know, fellow competitors. It's, it's fun and you can meet families who are interested in the same subjects. You can gain connections and insights. They're also often South Asian, so you might have other things in common besides just, you know, the competitions. Plus, it's fun. It's really enjoyable. And I'm not necessarily talking about the competition aspect. That may even be boring to you or you may enjoy it. It doesn't really matter. But just being in this environment of like, it gives you like a buzz, it gives you a competition buzz. You know, you go in there and then it's always fun to wait for the results, you know, and wonder if you'll be picked or not, wonder if you're going to win. It's just a, an enjoyable atmosphere and an enjoyable experience. Now, what are some of the benefits of participating in NSF? Well, first of all, it's an excellent award to put on applications. I don't necessarily mean college applications here, but even other things. Like I wrote, I wrote about my involvement with NSF in the cloning webinar that I did a while back on my Cosmos application, but that's something you could do or you could do something similar and write about the fact that you won a competition. It's definitely very prestigious and there's a lot of competition, you know, against you, even in regional. Land. So keep that in mind. It's also quite exciting to win. It's quite enjoyable and it feels like, you know, there's an objective tracker of your achievements. And if you're studying for a large competition, like I'm going to use the script spelling bee as an example here, but this also applies to other things like right? the international brain bee, um, science competitions like Science Bowl and Olympiad, anything like that even middle school science competitions. And this can help keep you on track, actually. I'm, I'm going to use a script spelling bee example here. Like I said, a lot of people who study for that spelling bee in, um, to get to it in middle school use NSF as stepping stones and kind of participate in our spelling competitions so that they can have a better um, knowledge of where they are and, you know, win these competitions on the side as well. And something that's interesting about NSF is that we may in a few cases have even stiffer competition than larger organizations. Like I know that in NSF finals for the spelling bee, it was very difficult, even, occasionally even more difficult than the scripts bee. So that's just something to keep in mind. These competitions are definitely not like significantly easier than those that are national. They're definitely worth trying out, competing, getting a good understanding of where you are compared to your competitors and just having fun too. It's, it's really enjoyable. That's all I had for, to share with you guys. So I think we can move on to the next presenter. Thank you, Maya. As I, as I showed you, it's so good. Uh, next, we move on to uh, Ritik Gumpu. Ritik is a ninth grader from WWB High School in North uh, New Jersey. Um, he's interested in math, computer science, and physics. In 2022, uh, uh, Math Counts National he helped his team win the gold medal and he's a three-time AIME qualifier 
uh, during a seventh, eighth, and ninth grades, and he is also uh, aiming for a US JMO qualification this year. In 2022 Science Bowl, he helped his team go to nationals and won fifth place overall. He has won several medals in Science Olympiad uh, invitationals and regionals. He likes programming challenges and participates in computing Olympiads, as well as he's created several websites and worked uh, on a machine learning program and that analyzes, calculates, and, uh, and diabetic levels. In his free time, he likes to play uh, sports, games, and creating games. He is here to talk to you about uh, kinematics. Uh, is Rithik, your um, slides are here? Okay. All right, so, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about kinematics today um, and then specifically like the kinematic formulas, the four of them. So, yeah. So what is kinematics? Kinematics is the branch of mechanics that covers uh, the motion of objects without like reference to other forces that cause it. And like um, you're excluding other like forces that are going to happen in the real world, such as air resistance, drag and other things, because we're just I idealizing the motion and making it simpler and easier to use. There are a few key variables that um, we're going to be using in the kinematic equations. And um, the five main variables are going to be D for displacement, U for initial velocity, V for final velocity, A for acceleration, and T for time. And um, note displacement is just um, the change in position um, between two places. So basically the distance. All right, the first uh, kinematic equation is V equals U plus AT, where V is the final velocity, U is initial, A is acceleration, and T is time. And the way we got this is basically, if there is no acceleration, AKA meaning A is zero, then if we plug that into our equation, we get that V is U. And this basically just means that if there's no acceleration, the final velocity and initial velocity are going to be the same because obviously you're not you're not changing your velocity in that scenario. And you can say the same thing for time equals zero because obviously v is going to be equal to u. And um, basically, if you uh, visualize it, for every uniform um, unit of time that you increase for every say second, um, your final velocity is going to change by a because um, t is going to increase by one meaning that a is going to increase by a. Uh, that means that the final velocity is going to increase by a meaning that for every unit of time your velocity is going to change by a which is how we get this formula basically and the initial velocity is added on to this because it's what we start off with so after t seconds the final velocity will just be v equals u plus a times t you can go on to the next slide all right, uh, this is going to be like a simple example. Um, if the velocity of a rolling ball, the final velocity is three meters per second, its starting velocity is two meters per second, and the acceleration is going four meters per second squared, how much time did it take to reach this final velocity of three meters per second? So using the formula V equals U plus A times T, you plug in the final velocity of three, uh, the initial velocity of two, and four meters per second for A. So three is equal to two plus four times T, meaning that in this case, T would be 0 0.25 seconds. So it takes 0 0.25 seconds to reach the three. Okay, my second formula is D equals U plus V all over two times T. And like I said before, D is displacement, AKA the change in position between two places. And um, uh, using like previous formulas, the formula for distance is um, the average velocity, like basically the change in velocity or times time. And the change, in, the average in velocity is basically just the initial velocity plus the final velocity all over two. Uh, so yeah, and that's how you get this formula. In case of, uh, since this uh, formula doesn't apply for um, A equals zero, um, when uh, there's no acceleration, using the first formula from before, V is gonna be equal to U meaning that if there's no acceleration, D is just gonna be U times T, which is just the formula for distance. Okay, uh, for uniform acceleration, 
meaning that acceleration doesn't increase or decrease throughout the period of time that you're going through. The distance covered will be the same um, if the object moves at an average velocity of u plus v over 2 constantly throughout the t seconds, right? Because that's going to be your average velocity, and you're going for t seconds of time. And since it's constant, you can use the kinematic formula because it deals with uh, uniform variables. And so d is equal to u plus v over 2 whole, whole, whole times t. OK, we have another example over here. If a bowling ball travels 40 meters, starting off with an initial velocity of 14 meters per second squared, I, well, 14 meters per second, I actually put 40 meters per second squared, and ending velocity of 6 meters per second, find the total time it travels for. Um, so we know that the final velocity is 14. Uh, no, the final velocity is six. The initial velocity is 14. And since it's uh, since you want to find the average, you just take the initial velocity plus the ending velocity all over two, which is 10, and then um, uh, multiply that by t to get your final distance. So 40 equals 10 times t. Therefore, it takes four seconds to to reach uh, this ending velocity. So the bowling ball travels for four seconds. You can go to the next slide. OK, Num this is equation number three. And for this one, there's no like explanation for it, but it is a substitution of the first two equations we just mentioned. So d equals ut plus at squared all over 2. Um, if you look at equation 1, we said that v is equal to u plus at, where um, obviously v is equal to the final velocity, u is initial, a is acceleration, t is time. And the second velocity, I mean, the second equation is d equals u plus v all over 2 times t, right? So writing it as the second equation, and plugging in v equals u plus at for it, we get d is equal to u plus v all over 2 times t, which is u plus u plus at all over 2 times t. And um, this is equal to 2u plus at all over 2 times t, which is 2ut over 2 plus a times t squared over 2, because you're just multiplying t by the entire numerator um, when you expand it out. And then simplifying that by dividing by 2, we get that d is just simply ut plus at squared all over 2. And this is a pretty important formula, as we'll see in the next example. Now you can move on to next. OK. So using, um, so we can solve this problem over here using the formula we just uh, showed. If the initial velocity of a ball facing rightwards is 3 meters per second, the acceleration is 6 meters per second, and the total time it's been accelerating for is 8 seconds, find the distance that the ball has traveled for. So in this case, um, you'll see that sometimes in physics problems, they they give some like information that's not necessarily important, such as the right word in this problem. We don't need to know that it's the right word. Um, it would work in I, any case, so you can just like X that out when you're reading it. Uh, try to highlight the important information when you're reading a problem because it might not be so straightforward. Okay, so d is equal to uh, ut plus one half at squared. And to plug it, we know that initial velocity, aka u, is 3, um, a is 6, and t is 8. So plugging that into our formula, we got d is equal to 3 times 8 plus 1 half times 6 times 8 squared. And this just gives 216 meters. So the ball has traveled for 216 meters. Uh, yeah, it's just a basic um, plugging in of our formula we just learned. And finally, this is our last kinematic equation t is equal to v squared minus u squared all over 2a. And um, using equation 1 again, we know that v is equal to u plus at. And um, we can uh, just plug this formula of t equals v minus u over a, which is just a rearrangement of equation 1, because uh, you can uh, subtract both sides by u and divide off a. So t is equal to v minus u over a. Uh, we get that from equation 1. And plugging that in into um, equation 2, which is d equals u plus v over 2 times t. We get that d is equal to u plus v over 2 times t, which is v minus u over a, which gives, multiplying the numerators and denominators, we get v plus u whole times v minus u all over 2a, which is just v squared minus u squared over 2a. OK, um, this is um, another example. Um, uh, we're having a soccer ball that's kicked with a velocity of 6 meters per second gradually decrease in acceleration by 3 meters per second squared over time and until the ball reaches 3 meters per second in velocity. And we want to find the total displacement of the ball's path. Okay, so the formula we had before is d is equal to u squared 
minus v squared all over 2a. And in this case, since we're decreasing by acceleration by 3 meters per second squared, a is going to be negative 3, which is something you have to notice in a problem. Like if it says increase by acceleration, it's going to be positive, And if it's decreased, it's going to be negative. So in this case, a is negative 3. Uh, I accidentally wrote acceleration is 3 at the bottom. But yeah, acceleration is negative 3. Um, initial velocity, as we can see by the problem, is 6. And final velocity is 3. So plugging this into our equation, d is equal to u squared minus v squared all over 2a, which is just uh, 3 squared minus 6 squared all over negative 6, which is 4.5. So the distance that the ball has traveled, aka the displacement, is 4.5 meters. All right, I just wanted to state a little bit about my north-south journey. And I got it. So basically, I started out north-south when I was, uh, I think, um, a third grader. And I got into it because of a friend. And it really helped me uh, grow as a person and develop. It enhanced my abilities in science and math. And it helped me find like new techniques and strategies to help solve these really interesting problems. So uh, I think it really helped me grow as a person. And like I think I recommend it to everyone uh, in this webinar to try it, try doing NSF because even if you don't do um, the best, you can always aim and try to push yourself further for next year and try to do better than you uh, uh, did before. Uh, so I think it's something that you can really motivate yourselves toward, uh, motivate yourselves toward. And I think uh, I recommend everyone to give their best and have fun. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Kritik. And uh, our next uh, um, pro is uh, Bhagirat Mehta. Uh, he's also no strangers to us, and he has taken part in the last couple of years of science MTP sessions. And uh, yeah, he's really my go-to person. Uh, he's a yeah, Stanford University graduate now with a bachelor's in both electrical and computer electrical engineering and computer science and also a master's in computer science in artificial intelligence in just four years he is a co-founder of meta plus an organization dedicated to mentoring the next generation of computational thinkers interdisciplinary researchers and change makers is doing it with his sister uh, he has participated in north south from the uh, first through fourth grade placing first in the math B in level one in even the second grade. In seventh grade, he won the first prize in national You Be the Chemist competition. In his freshman and junior years in high school, he placed first internationally with a perfect score in math kangaroo competition. He was also a national semifinalist in USA Biology Olympiad national science semi-finalist in USA Chemistry Olympiad and participated in AMC, AIME math competitions. At Stanford, he <clears throat> was part of IEEE uh, and the Stanford Pre-Business Association. <clears throat> Excuse me. His sophomore year, he led us to a Stanford trading team and won the first prize in Citadel, Citadel Security Algorithmic uh, Trading Competition in the in, with the international participations. Um, international Rotaman Trading Competition and was beating 50 other teams uh, all over the world. He is currently working as a software engineer and data scientist at Clockwork Systems, a startup solving clock synchronization and performance issues in distributed systems. He is also a researcher at the Stanford Genomic um, Genomic Technology Center. Uh, today, he'll be talking about interpreting data vis visualizations. Hey, thanks, Desi, and thanks to NSF and all of you for inviting me. Yeah, I'll be giving my talk today on interpreting data visualization. So as Desi mentioned, I uh, work as a software engineer at a startup. I also do research, and I'm the co-founder of an educational organization called MetaPlus. And so all three of these actually relate in the sense that I do data visualizations for my day job and for my research, and I teach a university level boot camp uh, on data visualization. So I, I borrowed some slides from MetaPlus to uh, give this lecture today. Uh, so there's two main kinds of visualization methods, uh, explanatory and exploratory. 
so explanatory uh, data visualizations. Uh, next slide, please. That's the process of showing something specific to an audience. So you have to ask yourself, what is the story you want to tell? And exploratory data visualizations are all about the process of getting familiar with the data. So I have some examples on the next couple of slides. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, one example of an explanatory data visualization can be highlighting different steps in a process. For example, the water cycle in environmental science. And so in the context of like a, the science bee, you have to think about how are these steps interconnected? How do they affect each other? What comes before or after a given step? And how does affecting one factor like uh, clear cutting a forest, how would that affect transpiration and thus condensation and precipitation? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> this can, these data visualizations can also be used to uh, illustrate concepts. So for example, uh, this is the food chain in, in the context of biology. Uh, and as a quick aside, uh, just for science bees or, or just in general, it's important to not just have rote memorization, but to truly understand and appreciate the science. So knowing tangential facts can be really helpful for retention. And you can combine maybe background knowledge like how 10% of energy and biomass is transferred between levels in the food chain uh, with the information on this chart to infer that, oh, maybe, you know, like 1% uh, of the uh, biomass of sharks uh, is, or 1% or, uh, of the biomass of mackerels is equal to the biomass of sharks in the ocean. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so in, in chemistry, sorry, one slide, yeah, before, yeah. So uh, they can be, you can use uh, data visualizations to organize information. As Maya talked about earlier, uh, you can understand how uh, the periodic table works and, and uh, you can think about how this, why this organization is significant and how different periods and groups are related to each other. Uh, next slide, please. And then the, the final example for explanatory data visualizations uh, is in physics. Uh, you can use this in physics or math to keep track of and visualize information like forces and moments acting on an object in a free body force diagram. Uh, and you can use this to perform calculations, like if a, a body is at rest or if it's in motion. <clears throat> next slide, please. And so I also have some examples of exploratory data visualizations. So these can be used to lay out data for the purpose of drawing insights. Uh, next slide, please. So I thought this was an interesting example of a historical exploratory data visualization. Uh, in the 1850s, there was a cholera outbreak in Soho, London, uh, and the germ theory of disease has not been yet developed. The prevailing theory was that cholera was caused by bad air, but Dr. John Snow in the UK didn't believe this. So he plotted out uh, on a map all the victims of cholera and realized that this wasn't a random distribution, but that they were actually clustered uh, specifically around a uh, public water pump on Broad Street. So if you look at the map, you can see a, a lot of data points are around Broad Street. And uh, it turns out that uh, at this public well, it was next to an old cesspool where uh, fecal bacteria from a baby's diaper was leaking. So this is an example of how data visualization was actually used to solve uh, where an outbreak uh, originated from. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, now I'll go over a couple of common scientific visualizations. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, a table is very common. Uh, it can be used to draw connections or relationships, uh, but you can also use this to infer some sort of relationship. So for example, for a gas, if everything else is kept constant, you can see in the uh, table above that uh, pressure and volume are inversely proportional. And this is actually uh, an illustration of Boyle's law. Uh, so in a competition, you might be asked to look up specific data points or interpolate intermediate data points and infer, okay, if the pressure is eight atmospheres, what would the volume be? Uh, then in the next slide, uh, a bar chart. So you can see that uh, there's you know many different formats for a bar chart. The, the general uh, format is the same, but it's important to understand what are the units, how do they differ. So for example, the y-axis in this case is in the thousands. Uh, it's also important to take a look at the legend uh, and then see if the bars are side by side or, or stacked. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, next slide, please. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, so there's uh, this is an example of a line chart. And so uh, you can see this is like the past uh, 170 years of uh, global average temperature. Uh, and you can use this to find trends, short term and long term. Uh, you can use it to see where there are outliers, what are minima and maxima. And you can also use this to see the whiskers. So the, the lines that are emanating from each point uh, above and below it, that's used to highlight like the minimum and maximum. 
for that year. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, a pie chart. These are fairly simple. Uh, they add up to 100% all the slices, uh, but some some of the times the slices may be small. Like in this chart of what uh, gases air is comprised of, you can see that there's one slice that's only 1%. Uh, and so it's also important to look at like the what are the notes written about what other gases uh, are included in that 1% slice, like carbon dioxide, argon, and water vapor. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, now, I thought it'd be fun to also go into some ways data visualizations can be misleading. And uh, this is something that you often see in politics. So I thought I'd be, uh, I'd give you a few examples from there. Yeah. So uh, it's important to understand how visualizations can be misleading. Uh, first of all, so that you don't accidentally make the, so, those sorts of mistakes when you're creating your own visualizations, but also so you understand when you're being manipulated. So on the next slide, you can see uh, there's a uh, bar chart on the left that compares what uh, the tax rate will be before and after uh, the Bush tax cuts uh, expire. And so you can see that there it looks like a very dramatic increase from 35% to 39.6%. But then if you take a closer look at the y-axis, it only goes from 34 to 42%. So this uh, truncated y-axis is used to make the uh, tax cuts uh, jump look much more dramatic than it might actually be. Uh, and then on the right, you can see that we have a pie chart, but all the different sectors add up to 193%. So it looks like each of the candidates uh, might be more popular than they actually are. Yeah, next slide, please. So, uh, and sometimes you can also have like uh, graphs that are that have insufficient context. So uh, under the President uh, Obama White House, you could see that uh, there was a uh, large increase in uh, the high school graduation rate, all the way from 75% to 82%. Uh, now, that looks like a huge uh, difference, and um, you know, certainly if you magnify on that, spe that specific year range, it, it, it looks pretty good. But if you take the broader context, you can see uh, that this is actually part of a longer-term trend. So under uh, President Clinton, under the second President Bush, uh, the uh, high school graduation rate was actually steadily increasing. Uh, now, while that trend has continued under President Obama, it, it's clear that this is just part of a longer-term trend and not necessarily due to any single president. Next slide, please. Uh, so my sister and I actually run a educational uh, YouTube and TikTok channel. And so we publish uh, videos on different scientific topics. And since I only have uh, about seven minutes for today's presentation, I thought it would be nice uh, to publish some videos on there to go more into depth into different topics. So uh, we'll, for example, be releasing a pie chart video later today on the history of pie charts, how to make a pie chart, and why they're often used despite not being very useful. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in the context of a scientific competition, like at North-South, it's important to interpret information. It's important to identify the legend, titles, axes, units, and understand the overall purpose of the visualization and contextualize it within the uh, information you already know and in the scientific body of knowledge that you've already been studying. But uh, more broadly, how do data visualizations connect to you? Well, a picture is worth a thousand words. So in my work, uh, my data visualizations can be used to make a revelatory and convincing sales pitch or help cure unknown diseases or, or maybe help uh, convince people to trade stocks. Uh, so why is it important to you as a student or as a parent? Well, data visualization can teach you a concept at just a single glance or perhaps drive home a point. So for example, in the uh, picture above, you can see uh, how dramatically measles cases decrease after the introduction of vaccines. There's no text associated with it other than you know the labels, but it's very obvious just from the the visualization. So uh, you know the visualizations are are ubiquitous and they can be used in whatever field you select, whether it's the humanities, for example, I've used it in data journalism to tell stories or uh, finance to see different trends in stocks or or machine learning if you want to see an overview of data and you want to think about how you want to uh, develop your model so uh, that you can have a more powerful artificial intelligence. So data visualization is, is important in any field that you choose, and it, it helps to digest the vast amounts of information around you in a compact manner and uh, take away uh, broad insights that can be used to uh, impact decisions and uh, just to help inform people. Thanks. And I'll take questions at the end. Yes, thank you, Bayret, and very interesting topic. And finally, we are coming to um, Sharwani, Sharwani Badlamani is a senior uh, at South Brunswick High School. 
who is interested in chemistry, physics, computer science. She has been competing in North South since she second grade. In 2018, she won the North South Intermediate Brain Bee. Since then, Shivani has won uh, first place in several Science Olympiad events, including thermodynamics at the state level, forensic at Columbia University, and environmental chemistry at Princeton. Her uh, robotic team qualified uh, for the VEX World Championship in 2020. And Shavani enjoys teaching science and has raised close to $2,000 for her chemistry and physics boot camps. In her free time, she enjoys developing Android mobile app. Now, um, welcome Shavani to talk about physics. Thank you. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about forces and dynamics today. So it was good that Rithik presented on kinematics because I can kind of build on that. So in this picture, we can see that there's a normal force being provided by the table. Now, what is a normal force? Um, for a lot of you guys, this might be a new concept because we generally think of forces as like gravity and maybe like the electrostatic force, but the normal force is something that's present in all of our lives all the time. And it's just the force that's um, acting perpendicular to any surface. So when you put an object on a table, the force that keeps it from falling through the table is the normal force. And let's talk a little bit about forces in general. So forces are pushes or pulls, and I'm sure you've heard this in your science classes already, but generally they're given in newtons, and this is kilogram meters per second squared if we were to like dimensionally analyze this. Um, forces are vectors, so they have both a magnitude and a direction. So that means that when you're adding forces, you need to consider both the magnitude and the direction. And generally it helps to set a positive direction before you start any problem because you want to be consistent with your negative and positive signs. Um, so some of the other common forces that you might encounter include tension and the normal force, as I just mentioned, the gravitational force, which acts on any object with mass. Um, and this is given by the equation F sub G is equal to mg, where m is mass in kilograms and um, g is acceleration due to gravity. Uh, this can be approximated by 9.8 meters per second squared. Some folks give it as 9.81 meters per second squared, but you'll usually use either 10 or 9.8 for the purpose of the NSF science contest. And the electrostatic force, which is between any charged objects, um, like charges repel and opposite charges attract. And you can find the magnitude of the electrostatic force through Coulomb's law, which I didn't put here, but it relates the charges of the two objects with the distance between them. And so it's inversely proportional to the square of their um, distance. Next slide, please. Okay, so a common thing that's tested on the NSF science contest, whether that's intermediate or the senior level, is Newton's laws. So Newton has three laws of motion, and I'll be talking about them today. The first one is that an object will not change its motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now, what is an unbalanced force? So when you're considering this law, you need to make sure that you're considering the net force on an object, not just one individual force. The net force is the vector sum of all the forces acting on an object, which means that you need to consider both the magnitude and the direction of each and every force that's acting on an object. And so once you consider the net force, if the magnitude of the net force is not zero, then that means the object is accelerating, so its motion is changing. Otherwise, its motion is um, uniform. And so, for example, if I was in a car and I was taking a sharp turn, um, my body wants to keep going in a straight line. However, the car turns left or right or whatever direction you pick, which means that in order for my motion to change, in order for me to accelerate and change direction, some other force has to act on me. In this case, it might be the friction from my seat or the seat belt that restrains me and keeps me going in the direction that my car is moving. 
but otherwise I would just fly straight and keep going in that direction because my motion is not affected unless there is an unbalanced force acting on it. Um, the second law that we are going to be talking about is sigma f equals ma. And this can kind of be stated as the amount of acceleration that an object experiences is proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So here, acceleration is given in meters per second squared, mass is given in kilograms, and force is given in newtons. And the third law that I want to talk about is every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Now, this is pretty simple to understand. When you push on an object, it pushes back on you. When you're walking, you push down on the ground, the ground pushes up on you, so you're able to keep going. And so you can kind of visualize this as when you're pulling on like, I don't know, a wall or something. The wall kind of uh, pulls back on you or through like a rope. If you were to attach it to a wall, the rope pulls back on you and you feel that restraint. So there's never just going to be an interaction where one object acts on another object without the other object applying a force to the first object. Next slide, please. So um, this example problem is something that's typically asked in almost every senior national finals contest. Like I always saw this when I was competing. Um, so we consider a box with a mass of five kilograms and an acceleration of three meters per second squared. So I want to know what the net force is on this object. And um, in order to solve this problem, we're going to make use of the second um, law of motion from Newton. And this is sigma f equals ma. Now, sigma f represents the net force on the object. And in this case, we could just multiply the mass and the acceleration. So 5 times 3 is equal to 15 newtons. Next slide, please. So now we have a follow-up question. If there is a frictional force of 10 newtons acting left, and someone is pulling on the box to the right, how much force is the person applying? Well, to answer this, we have to consider, again, the net force. And I would um, first break this problem down into its positive and negative direction. So I set my positive direction to be right in this problem. So the net force would be total force right versus the total force left. And in this equation, I put sigma f equals f right minus f left equals, and then I substituted the force of the person who is acting um, in the rightward direction minus the force of friction, which is acting in the left. Now, the minus um, can be thought of as a plus negative because um, what I did is I set the left direction to be negative, and I'm just adding the vectors of the force to the right and the force to the left. So now substituting 10 newtons for the frictional force to the left, we can see that the entire force or the net force on the object is 15 newtons. Solving for the force of the person, we get 25 newtons. So in order to overcome the force of friction to the left and also provide the acceleration that we had in the um, previous slide, we need to apply a force of 25 newtons. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sharvani. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it clearly shows how much of effort and time you are putting in bringing this uh, presentation to all of us. And then we, on the behalf of all the audience, thank you very much for, for your efforts. Um, so let me go back and look at some questions. Please, you can post your questions to um, any specific uh, panelist or in general. And then uh, So let's see. Okay, so it's, it's a general question. Uh, did you all go for a formal science coaching outside of NSF coaching? And what are your recommendations? Who wants to go first? Uh, yeah. Outside of NSF, I mostly did school science. I'm not so sure that there was external coaching. I think mostly the best way for me to learn was just by studying 
through competitions, you know, finding the syllabus, looking up things on my own, or using school textbooks, that kind of thing. Um, I think it also helps to kind of go beyond the syllabus of what NSF provides. Like, that's just an outline, and you need to remember that your own discoveries are the most important thing when competing in things, because oftentimes the competitions won't be able to provide you every resource that you need to get like 100% on the test. But what you can do is go beyond what they give you and keep going into each topic and finding even the little details and Googling everything that you're confused about, because that will actually help you a lot more than any coaching that you can get. I didn't have any uh, formal coaching from outside, but uh, certainly, certainly as I was studying, you know, any syllabus, my parents would be right there, like, you know, walking through it, asking me questions, quizzing me, like, at all, all times of the day. Uh, and I think what's important is, uh, as, as Sharvani touched on, uh, you know, not just sticking to the syllabus, but going beyond it. So, for example, I would be riding a bike and, and my, my dad would ask me, okay, how, how fast do you think you're going? And then we would, like, measure the, the radius of the wheel, use that to figure out the circumference and figure out how many rotations per second I was going. And, and if your first principles are very strong, you can, you know, use that to infer a lot of information uh, around you in your daily life. So just asking any questions uh, around you that you think you can answer with the, the scientific knowledge you have available is, is a powerful way to, I think, uh, strengthen your, your base of knowledge and, and uh, realize like how many ways uh, it can be applied. Ritik, anything? Uh, no, I think uh, Shervani, Maya, and um... Uh, I, I think they basically just said what I wanted to say, like, and, and um, Bhagavad, I, I think, I think he, they basically all just said what I wanted to say, yeah. Thank you. Um, I know Naratsa doesn't share the old question papers to, uh, uh, to anyone, but uh, uh, is there a way, is there a place they can find a sample papers in science in the previous years? not just a sample but the full link papers for practicing if you if you register for the competition they provide you with a sample paper to practice using if i remember yeah. correctly yeah yeah it says uh, not the sample just the whole test i would also say um don't just practice on the uh like the nsf tests themselves i would say try to find samples of like other tests say i mean if you're doing science i would say um probably find like um like a depending on what area you want to focus on try to find a previous like science olympiad test i would say like if you want to focus on chemistry specifically environmental chem or like say chem lab i would say try to find a good practice test from them usually states or like princeton or mit or one of these invitationals Thank you. Yeah, for NSF specifically, the science Olympia test might be a little bit advanced, but they definitely help you learn concepts. Um, I'd also say like quiz bowl questions tend to help. Um, I also use a lot of just Khan Academy. It doesn't matter if the level you're learning isn't necessarily the level that corresponds to your grade. Like on Khan Academy, it might be listed as middle school, but that could still be tested on your NSF exam. So what matters more is that you're learning the concept and not limiting yourself to just the grade that you're in or whatever level it says on the syllabus, because like, I think the test raters expect you to go a little bit further than what they've provided and they expect you to learn on your own. Thank you. And uh, can you share any uh, tips to study for the Science Olympia to how to get into Science Olympia? Um, for me personally, uh, you're talking about like Science Olympia, like the one that has like regionals and then nationals, that one, right? I, I guess so, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I've been doing it since middle school, and I think what really helps is applying the same like philosophy, I guess, to any competition is really going in depth and going beyond the resources that are provided on the website. So for me, I use like a college level textbook to study for my high school level competitions, like college level chemistry. Uh, so I feed into like organic chemistry, even though that's not on my test necessarily, because there are questions from the most random things. And what helps is really using a textbook that isn't 
exactly your level but can help you learn anything that isn't covered in your like school syllabus i also use khan academy and practice tests from like rithik mentioned mit princeton there's also really good ones from yale upenn upenn is very hard and definitely a good resource and if you're studying for the middle school tests i'd say just going into the high school AP curriculums and pulling some stuff from that for the biology, chemistry, and physics-based events. And then for inquiry, just doing a lot of practice, that helps as well. Yeah, I can probably give a little bit of context about Science Olympiad in case someone is interested in joining. Basically what happens is there's a bunch of different events they're fairly specific. Like I remember the ones I did were like detector building and geologic mapping. And within those, <laughs> at each like invitational or competition, you're given some tests. You have to fill them out and they're like completely specific based on your topic. I guess most of the preparation that Shivani said, yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, make sure you look at something that's a little bit higher than your level. Look for like specialized textbooks. It's a lot of like mostly work and effort. You think about your topic, you find all the information you can. Some events let you use like cheat sheets, which is where you can just bring in your notes. So that's, it really like skews towards good preparation beforehand, making sure that you know you're ready for your event. How to get into it? I'd highly suggest starting in middle school because I did not and that made it a lot harder for me to get the hang of Science Olympiad. So yeah, start in middle school. It's definitely fun and a good use of your time. Uh, and as, as people said previously, it's important to yeah, maybe study a level or two higher than what the test is oriented towards, supposedly. So like if you're participating in like a high school level Olympiad competition, then you should be looking at college level textbooks. Okay. And uh, what, what other science competitions that you have taken part other than NSA? I know we read out a bunch of uh, your competitions and not all you participated right um, if you want i can talk about the summer program cosmos it's not really a competition but it's in the same like ballpark it's a it's mostly for high schoolers like 10th and 11th graders but it is like a residential summer program where you go to one of the ucs personally i went to uc santa cruz because that's where they have this program you stay there for four weeks like a college student in the dorms that kind of thing and you take classes on a topic that you choose like again for me it was nanochemistry and nanotechnology which was very interesting it was quite fun <laughs> you get to experience like being a college student and it is fairly expensive it's like four thousand dollars but it's worth it because you kind of have a better understanding of what you're going to do in college plus the content is high level and you can maybe make connections there that you can use if you want like a research opportunity anything like that it's pretty good yeah other than that i've done like science bowl i'm doing the brain bee this year and i've done a few in the past just fairly you know, like the okay, the competitions that they kind of provide at house schools, like those. Do they, do they depend upon the school you are in um, to organize all these Olympiads, or you can do it yourself? Um, you need to have a team for most of them. Like Science Bowl needs a team of five. Science Olympiad needs a team of like 15. So most of the time you do depend on your school. I guess you can try and join eat teams from outside schools. I don't know if that's a thing that they really do, but you can definitely you you need a team basically okay yeah i think also just competing in olympiads like not necessarily just science olympiad but there's like chemistry olympiad physics olympiad biology olympiad there's things for everyone there's even like um the amc sequence and then amy and yeah all that so I think picking like a subject and really focusing on it helps a lot for whatever you want to do because you can get really really good at that one contest and really progress through your high school career and I guess you can start in middle school as well if you're doing AMCs um, and qualify for Amy I think Rithik did right yeah so you can qualify for Amy in middle school itself and then keep preparing and even qualify for the national team at some point so those competitions are really good and actually touching back on the previous question those competitions provide really good like sample questions for any other science contest that you might be preparing for 
I guess yeah. we're, maybe we could give like a little bit of context. Is there just like there's some like I mentioned, I know that I mentioned USABO. There's a bunch of these competitions that are USA wide competitions for a specific branch in STEM, like they have math, biology, chemistry, physics, and they also have some other stuff that's like astronomy and linguistics, but that's less relevant. For each of these, it's uh, an intensive test completely focused on the subject in question and they require a lot of study but if you do enough and if you know enough you can progress up to like a national levels where you get to go to camps and it's extremely prestigious and difficult naturally so that's yeah and the amc track kind of leads into that at least the ame which leads to the usamo which is the math version of this usa olympiad yeah, so my dad was actually one of the organizers of the Science Bee, so I wasn't able to participate. And so I was looking for opportunities outside of NSF. Uh, so the American Institute of Chemists, uh, they have their own like competitions for chemistry, and there's also the UB the Chemist competition. Uh, and then as uh, has been previously touched on, like there's uh, the International Math Olympiad, but there's also like uh, similar international Olympiads in different fields like biology and chemistry and so some people choose to you know spend all four years of maybe their high school uh, career focusing on just training for the International Biology Olympiad or Chemistry Olympiad or Physics Olympiad uh, but uh, you can also just do you know there's computer science yeah or, or computer science or yeah linguistics yeah uh, there's all sorts of Olympiads but specifically in science um, you know it, it might help if you are you know doing something that's similar to what you're doing in class. So if you know you're taking physics that year, then participating in the International Physics Olympiad will definitely, you know, take your physics skills further than they need to be for your class purposes. And uh, y these are individual competitions, so you can study for them on your own. There might be like a minimum number of people that uh, your school needs to participate, but I'm sure that you can find other people like that and, and encourage your, your school to sponsor you. So you might have to, you know, be uh proactive and making sure that like your, your teachers sponsor you but since there's very little work involved uh other than you know supervision uh oftentimes they're happy to do it even if this is not like something that's traditionally uh, available at, at your school so um i think this is it was great for me for preparation it helped me for example for the ap test that i took uh and um it just prepared me very well for college since i was uh, ahead of the curve and a lot of people i know for example started studying like college classes like organic chemistry all the way back in, in high school just to prepare for these competitions. So I think these are very good motivating factors just to uh, learn. Um, <clears throat> the next one is, um, do you use any special strategies to remember the concepts? Is there anything you would recommend? Um, I think I actually have something for this. I think that the best strategy I used was just to like kind of enjoy what I'm learning because when I think something is fun and when I'm interested in something, it kind of sticks in my brain and that happens with everyone. If you want to read something and you think about it, you know, as interesting, as fun, it'll just naturally stick in your brain and you'll be able to remember it no problem at all. So I guess coming at your studies or coming at whatever you're reading from the perspective of this is going to be fun, this is going to be interesting is the best way to do that, you know? Like you could think of chemistry, I guess, or you think of trends on the periodic table as, okay, this is just boring. This is just something I need to memorize. But instead of doing that, you think about what are the different factors that go into making this happen? How does this relate to the real world? Why should I be interested in that? And then once you find, you know, your interest or what the best part of whatever it is you're learning, then it'll just stick in your head. Good. <clears throat> Uh, talking about those competitions, uh, is there a difference between Science Bowl and Science Olympia? Do you need different preparations? Yeah, they're they're pretty different. Science Bowl is more like fast paced, I think. So bonuses are like 16 seconds and toss ups. I mean, yeah, and toss ups are like four to eight. So it's like really fast paced, whereas Science Olympia is like 50 minutes for a test. So I think. Uh, Science Olympia tests you more in your knowledge and science will test you more in your speed and accuracy. There is essentially different competitions. At Science Olympia, again, you get one topic, whole test, you have to work on that, like Rithik said. While Science Bowl is general science, you need to know everything. You have a team of five with probably different strengths, and then it's a buzzer. So you, you whack, you know, you, you press the button if you know the answer, again, is speed based. In terms of different preparations, I don't 
I mean, I guess Science Olympiad, you have a very, very specific topic. Like, for example, if you want to learn about detector building, you're not that's mostly physics and that kind of thing. You're not going to necessarily learn about biology within that, within that event. For Science Bowl, your specialty differs, but it's usually going to be something vague like physics, chemistry, biology, math, and earth science were specialties on my team. So what we'd each do is we'd each study, you know, that, but it's still a much broader branch that you're looking at for science school than for science Olympiad. And I think for, for preparing, it's important to try to like replicate the, the test conditions if you can. So like if you can uh, practice like buzzing in uh, for, for something like Science Bowl, uh, I participate in things like Scholastic Bowl or Academic Bowl. Uh, and certainly, certainly with like, you know, the fact that you're trying to race and beat, beat the other team to the buzzer, you can, you know, be uh, sometimes overly quick, not finish understanding the entire question. So practicing those skills is important. And then uh, since a lot of these tests have like, you know, very short time limits, it's important to have like strong mnemonic devices, try doing things like, you know, recreate the periodic table from scratch. Uh, if you can, you know, memorize those and, and just have concepts where you're doing less memorization, but you can build up from like, uh, just just the first principles that you know. So for example, if you know like the, the how to calculate the area of a circle and you know the, the height of a cylinder, you should be able to, you know, uh, reverse engineer what's the formula to calculate the volume of a uh, cylinder uh, rather than just directly memorizing it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's helpful. Um, are there any good uh, weekly science magazines for middle schoolers? You guys know of? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I've read the magazine Wired before. I don't know how much that has to do with science, but it's pretty like technological and nerdy in some senses. So if that's something you want to check out. Uh, I think there's a lot of like websites that maybe cater to like specific like medical news or um, uh, bio biology related discoveries news. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, you, you can just find it if you're just looking at different articles or the more you research, sometimes you'll see like um, these kind of like uh, advice columns kind of thing that focus on a specific topic like meteorology. Uh, as far as uh, magazines go, even though these are uh, certainly higher level uh, than, than maybe for like elementary or middle school, uh, Scientific American, Nature, Science, um, if you just try to start reading those, then ultimately like, you know, you'll be Googling so many terms, you'll be understanding so much that, that it'll kind of force you to learn at a faster pace, uh, this kind of like immersion. It's kind of like uh, going to another country and, you know, without being able to speak the language, trying to watch TV, uh, kind of forces you to learn how to speak it. So uh, I, I think, you know, even if it's not meant for a middle school level, uh, it's it's a good idea to try to look at, you know, uh, research papers or, or articles that um, meant for any level. Try National Geographic. It might be helpful if you're inter interested in animals and I guess more biology concepts. Unmute myself. Okay. As a fourth grader, where should I start? For science, obviously, I think. Um, I think it really depends on how much you already know, but I'll say something general. Um, so you can start, I guess, for the NSF sign contest. I'm just going on that. You can start with the books that they provided and looking through the syllabus. But after that, you can kind of look through the syllabus and pick topics that could potentially be asked in more depth and go on Khan Academy. From Khan Academy, you could actually go to either Okay, this might be a bit advanced, but you could go to a high school textbook if you really wanted to, or you could go into a middle school textbook. And I think the middle school te textbooks are also linked on the NSF website. So you could go from there to the middle school level and prepare with some quiz bowl style like questions. And also just garnering like a general interest in science is really important at that level, I think. So keep reading about like things that are happening in the news and reading magazines might help, reading about like, I don't know, different innovations in the fields that you're interested in, that's also really helpful. So yeah. Um, yeah, something that we often say like in science, something that's often said is that, you know, kind of all the sciences are connected, but it's interesting because biology is 
or based on chemistry, chemistry is based on physics, and then physics is based on math. So that's maybe a good order to go in because you could start with physics because if you know some topics in physics, such as like electron attraction, that kind of thing, you'd be better able to understand chemistry, why they're why bonds form in the way they do, what kind of interactions they have with each other. And then through chemistry, you can better understand biology because DNA is a molecule, right? You can understand why it has the interactions it does, how proteins are formed, more of that. So again, each science kind of, if you go physics and chemistry and biology, each science will kind of give you a foundation for the next one. Yeah. Uh, when I was younger, I used to love going to museums. So like I'm from Chicago, we have plenty of science museums there, like the Field Museum, Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, and I remember one of the uh, NSF national competitions were, was held in Ohio. So when I was there in Columbus, uh, we visited the Kosi Museum. So uh, I, I think that's a great place to just start because it, uh, the material is meant to be accessible there. And it's, it's always fascinating, interesting, for example, to see like a, a giant statue of a dinosaur. Um, and then, you know, start learning about like prehistoric, um, you know, animals from there. Uh, and so you, you can then start, you know, by going to your local library, checking out the books. I remember like my mom would put on hold like various books that are starting with like the picture book level, you know, some books would be more fun. Like the, there's a book called the periodic table by, uh, Simon Basher, I think, um, where like each element was given like a personality. And so that really helped, uh, me memorize, you know, what are the different properties and traits of different different uh, elements and so uh like I, I know by heart the like the the new decimal system 540 and 541 those are where the chemistry books are located because uh, i would have like an entire stack of uh books or movies uh or or just uh different resources that i would be looking at to start learning the basics of chemistry and then once those are solidified right really hone in on those uh specific concepts and i would i would work my way up to like higher level um you know textbooks or or, or readings uh and, and and the thing is there's all sorts of like practice questions or tests you can find on any subject online or through you know websites like like quizlet or um i think it's called pro profs um so it, it, once you you know start getting really good at these questions and, and being able to uh, memorize the answers you know you, you can also watch videos like uh, from like schlesinger media uh th then you can you know start uh trying to answer like, you know, higher level tests. So, you know, maybe even though you're in middle school, you could look at like, what are the questions that are on an AP chemistry test uh, for, for high school? And those are really college level classes. So, um, you know, the, 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 the more time you have, the, the earlier you start, the better. And then, you know, you can certainly work your way up and, and continue uh, trying to get as uh, uh, crystal clear of an understanding as you can about, uh, and, and go as, as deep as you need to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, one other. Yeah, I just wanted to say this book is so good. This I I got this at like Costco a long time ago, and I was reading it because it was interesting. It has information about almost everything, and it you know presents it in a really fun way too, with a lot of graphics, that kind of thing. It has biology, chemistry, physics, and some other stuff too. I I can't remember where it is, but it has it has everything. So yeah, just try and get this book. It's really good. Yeah. Can you give the name and the author? Yeah, it's or... healthier. It's healthier kids with science, and it doesn't have an author on it, but it's okay. from like dk.com. I don't mm -hmm. know here. This is what it looks like. Yeah. And then it's yeah. from dk.com. Yeah. I just remember getting it at Costco like a long time ago, but it's very, very good. Good. But actually, one of the um, listeners have said science news for students is a good uh, source. They have started a magazine subscription also recently, she says. So, not talking about the journals and the books, um, that may be one of the uh, new ones coming up. Um, is there any good books for elementary kids to begin with? So, whatever you're saying, Maya, good for elementary school kids? It's mostly, I mean, yeah, fifth, fourth and fifth graders mostly, and then middle schoolers. For elementary kids, I don't know if there. I went to a school called Challenger, and I was in for a little while when I was in elementary school, and they made us use these textbooks. I don't have them with me right now. Um, McGraw Hill textbooks, and they have them for I think first to fifth grade or something. They might have them like for first to eighth grade, but those textbooks are good because they split stuff up into like little modules, little lessons to give you review questions, and they mostly have the information that you will need for science. They're actually the ones recommended by NSF, if I remember correctly. They're quite good. They, I don't 
remember exactly what they're called, but it's just called like science. My girl textbooks. They might be on the NSF website. You can take a look at that. In the website, yeah, probably. Um, I would also recommend like if you're gonna buy those books, buy one grade above what you are because I think that would help you more since a lot of the topics do overlap in those books and I've personally used them. I think it would be better to just start with the slightly more advanced stuff because they do cover the stuff from the previous book as well in a lot of them. So it would just be helpful to purchase the next level and then keep going like that. Yeah, and, and this isn't a book, it's, it's a kind of series of DVDs, but uh, I remember after my family went to Disney World, I mean, that was also an educational opportunity, not just for fun. So there's this entire set of uh, DVDs called the uh, the World of Imagineering, uh, where they go uh, into in depth into like physics topics like uh, trajectory uh, or, or forces and motion, and, and uh, they illustrate how these are used in each ride around Disney World. So I think that's a really fun introduction into a lot of these um, scientific topics. Um, as well as like if you go to like you know events at like nearby colleges or national labs when they have open houses, uh, you can oftentimes see presentations uh, that are oriented towards even like younger age groups uh, on on just you know like what is a like cyclotron for example at, at the national lab. Uh, yeah, these, these are there's a lot of great places to start. Um, you know, books, websites, uh, TV shows, uh, all of these. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we are already exceeding the time limit, but one last question I'll put is, uh, what are the best websites or magazines for the first graders or the second graders? Who are Khan interested in science Khan and Academy math? Khan Academy can again be useful here, because I know they have like second grade, third grade, um, what do you call them? Like groups of information, which would be pretty suited to these kind of competitions, the first graders. Check that out, do some practice problems on there, see if it works for you. Um, you have to remember, like uh, Maya said, Khan Academy is really good. And just building on that, you have to remember that the contests in NSF are three grade levels at a time or like two grade levels at a time. So when you're competing as a first grader, you have to keep in mind that you also are expected to learn things from second and third grade. So yeah, you should start with your grade. But always keep in mind that you need to go a little bit beyond what you are, especially if you're in the younger grades in the um, contest that you're in. So I think what helped me, I don't know if this is still a thing, but brain pop, like brain pop was a thing when I was younger. So that was really helpful. And Khan Academy. Um, I also use like just just Googling things like that really helped. I know that's pretty obvious, but Google helped a lot. And you can kind of find like one or two websites that like simplify concepts for you and stick with those and just go through the entire like syllabus within that website and you can learn a lot of things that aren't even on the syllabus that are just fun to learn. There's, there's a lot of uh, do they still have a natural geography for kids and uh, books subscriptions okay yeah go ahead sorry bye bye yeah yeah, there's there's a lot of publishers like uh, DK, uh, Scholastic, and and a lot of like uh, also like YouTube videos uh, channels, also like uh, Bozeman Science Khan Academy um, uh, Crash Course. So uh, I think a lot of these like uh, YouTube videos though are are more useful for summarization. So it's good for review at the end or like just before you you know you're going to the competition. But uh, it's probably yeah better to, to start from uh, smaller books and you know you can you can start from like uh, picture books uh, that are used to explain basic concepts and and then uh work your way up good yeah, thank you yeah we are uh, already at five minutes so thank you all for attending this uh, very interesting session and uh, i hope you got a lot out of it i thank all these pros uh, for the time efforts and patience in answering all the questions and also efforts taken to make a presentation uh, in fact all of them continue to give back to north south as uh, volunteers or coaches or educators uh, in various subjects in uh, science or any other subjects uh, we cannot really thank them enough for their contributions uh, the recorded link of this session will be sent to you tomorrow along with the link for the presentations they had made um, and uh, please do fill in the feedback form before you leave so that i will share with the uh, panelists uh, later in this week and as we mentioned, we are continuing with this theme with another uh, webinar uh, two weeks from today on May 5th um, 
on map. So we will have, we'll assemble a few math uh, wizards to come and share their experiences with you. So please uh, look for our uh, um, email with the information about the details and uh, the link and do register, participate. And then uh, we really thank you for your continued support. And thank you guys, everybody for, for all your time and efforts. And uh, hopefully we will connect again soon. Uh, in the next sessions and thank you everybody and then we'll see you all here next time bye for now thank you thank you thank you bye bye um rithik if you need to change any of your slides you know um, you know you can go ahead and do it now so that i would um, send a link to the people tomorrow because you said you had some velocity with the second square and things like that. So yeah, I'll, I'll change my slides a bit. Yeah. Please just make sure those things are all changed. And uh, thank you, thank you, Bhagirat, Charvani.